Hi, good afternoon, everybody. If I can quieten the room, we're about to get started with our next session in the SDG Media Zone. Thank you. If we can quieten the room at the back. Thank you. We're coming live to you from New York at the UN United Nations headquarters at the SDG Media Zone. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Natasha with Glamour Magazine, who's going to lead our next panel of very special guests. Thank you. Is it working? Oh, it's working. There we go. Yes, yes, we're all working. We're working. Are you working? <laughs> hello, hello. <Yeah. laughs> lovely, Hi, lovely. I'm really thrilled to be hosting this panel today on maternal health, which is unfortunately with rising maternal mortality rates around the world, it couldn't be more urgent. Um, and, um, you know, it does impact women of color the most around the world. So I think this is a really desperately important panel and a really great topic to be gathered here today. I am so delighted to welcome Ciara, the award-winning, Grammy award-winning singer and songwriter, entrepreneur and philanthropist, and Patricia De Silva, the program advisor for the UN's FPA's Initiative for People of African Descent. So thank you both for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ciara. You're obviously quite pregnant. <laughs> and um, I'm enormously grateful that you've taken the time to be here today. And I think I'd really want to talk about your own personal experiences in pregnancy and postpartum and why the topic of mental health, maternal health is so important to you. Um, childbirth and raising a newborn is particularly leveling. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I remember my first time having my first child. Um, and that's such an incredible experience. You know, it's always something that I, I always wish that any person that can experience it gets you because it really is a blessing. And it is a world of the unknown. You're like, I don't know what I'm about to get into, but I'm excited for the unknown. I'm excited to bring this precious baby into the world, but what does this mean? What is life going to be like? Am I going to be ready for this new journey I'm going to go on? You ask all these questions, but especially when it comes to the health part of it. You know, I was so blessed to have a really great caring staff that attended to me. Um, my primary doctor, um, Dr. Sabina, and my obstetrician, Dr. Katz, and they were always on top of everything for me. And I felt so blessed to have that experience. And I feel like for me, it was game changing because it didn't matter how big or small the challenges were for me, or not challenges, but the questions that I had were, they were always there, right? So that made the experience even more special. And every day walking into my, um, my ultrasounds, like all these little moments, like every little thing was something special to me. Even though it may have been a small moment in the process, it was really big to me because it's my first time. And then of course the postpartum part of it, um, you know, that was a very, um, you realize that that's just as important as a process of getting up to having a child. How you take care of your body is everything. Who's, taking, who's helping you take care of your body is everything. So I was very fortunate to have a great support system along the way, but I also have learned so much about how a lot of women aren't like me. There aren't a lot, there, there are other places that take care, that are helping with you know, childbirth and you know, doctors, um, obstetricians, um, primaries that aren't necessarily given the care that I was able to have. So that's why maternal health is one of the things that I'm a, I'm, I'm a part of and supporting today is really important to me because we need to shine a light on what's, what these true astounding things that I've learned are. It's time to really, really stand up and speak out. And so I'm just really proud to be here to talk about this today. And so it's very meaningful to me. Um, and that's why I'm here. I mean, I just want to say thank you because it really takes a lot to have someone with an enormous platform to get behind an issue that for too long is being ignored. And I think about this a lot. You know, you talk about the access to postpartum care that you had, and we're right now in a situation in America where there are, you know, maternity deserts. So I think it's in 30 counties, more than three, you know, around the states. There is yeah. very few access. Many, many women have almost no access within an hour or two hours drive of their house, which means that if something happens postpartum, they have no access to it, and it takes a long time. And I think... One of the things I'm actually interested to talk about, and I'm going to throw to you, Patricia, a little bit about this, is that one of the big SDG goals is, you know, reducing the rates of maternal mortality. And right now, that is the, S you know, the rate is double the SDG, the SDG goal globally. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, your, your focus is Afro-descent. You know, you've just published a big new study about the, the terrible rates of women of Afro-descendant who are susceptible to maternal mortality and what you're working on to try and change 
Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. And first of all, thank you so much for really amplifying this conversation. We need to continue to talk about this. It's a very important issue uh, for all of us, certainly for us at UNFPA. We are the Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, and ending preventable maternal health is one of our uh, three transformative results, something that we really work towards very, uh, very closely. So, so we did an analysis this year, and what we found out, um, which, um, it's really staggering is that women of African descent in the Americas are dying at a rate of almost five times more than other groups. That's just completely unacceptable. Like you just said, we lost gains that we have made in terms of ending preventable uh, maternal, uh, maternal mortality. Uh, and uh, women of African descent and other racialized groups really are taking the brand of it. So what we find out is that systemic racism, sexism, lack of access to quality care, and I'm going to emphasize here quality care for women of African descent, it is a really, really big problem, is one of the main causes, um, but also just a complete um, lack of respect. They don't get that uh, respectful maternity care that is necessary for us to have really successful outcomes when we give birth and post-birth, like you said as well. I mean, the interesting thing for me when I saw delving into the statistics was I think it was four in five of these postpartum deaths, and this is specific to the US, are preventable. And 53% of these deaths are happening po seven days to one year postpartum. And I think it really comes back, and I actually had a question for you ab about the importance that you've placed on postpartum care, because if you think about, you know, most of the deaths are happening postpartum. For you, what, was the, what were the things that you valued most from your postpartum care? Well, you know, as I mentioned, my team was really on it for me. <clears throat> we talked about, you know, for a great example, I learned that I had diastasis recti um, after my first child. So you don't know what that is. Your ab basically your abdominal wall kind of splits post-childbirth. And I didn't understand. I'm like, why this pooch thing? Like, people were saying I was pregnant well before I was because of my diastasis recti because I had a nice pooch if I ate a good hamburger. Um, <laughs> but being able to have someone call it out for me was important, right? Even vitamins for your body, right? Knowing things like having theracumin, how that's key. Even in my pregnancy right now, something that's really interesting, and it's not postpartum, but it's while I'm in the process, is I learned that black women are more, pre more predisposed to having preeclampsia, right? And so now I take a baby aspirin every day. This is new for me. I didn't have to do this my first, my one, two, and my third child. Now it's, I'm doing it now because it's a true, clear discovery that this is what's happening for us. So, you know, being able to have that information, things like that are game changing. But I really was about following the rules. Like, follow, I, I, again, I got excited about going to ultrasounds, but I thank my team for that because they made that process really, really um, exciting, but also really important, right? So, um, but postpartum is critical, you know? Um, your body goes through this crazy like experience and, tr and transformation. You just breath. You give birth to a new child. I mean, like think about that—a whole new being. I look at my kids. I'm like, am I an alien out. or something? <laughs> like, I'm like, what in the world? Because they start. You see them from so little, and they're so big. You're like, I did that. You're so proud, but it's a real like fact that you gave birth to this beautiful baby, but your body has taken some beating up. And it's a process for us, and that postpartum is key. So I also learned in this journey that within six weeks, there's also the mortality, high mortality rate that happens within the six week process. And so you don't think about that when you're, you, you're like, the baby's here, woo, okay, we're good. No, you're not good all the way. Like, you have to make sure you're still taking care of yourself. You're still doing your checkups that you need to do. If you have something that feels uncomfortable to you, raise your hand, call your doctor, don't hesitate. And also to the doctors, listen, be ears, be ears for us ladies. Like, this is honestly crushing to me as a woman of color to know these numbers. It's like we have to have more compassion in the world. We have to care for every childbirth matters. So we have to, my greatest thing and what I really want to do is also today speak out to the, the doctors and let's level up how we're educating the staff. Let's level up how we are really putting the plans together to take care of women postpartum and also during their pregnancies because again, every childbirth matter. Like you think about our world, the diversity of our world, 
is what makes us so powerful and so beautiful. Like when I look out and see so many colors in this room, that's what makes us beautiful as a country and as a world. And so every childbirth matters. You never know what child it's gonna be that's gonna go be in future leader of this world, right? And it you, doesn't, it's not determined by the race. It's just by the circumstance of the individual. Like, so that opportunity is so important to me, you know? Um, so yeah. There's actually two things from what you said that I'd love to explore a bit more. The first one was you talk about, um, you know, the preeclampsia that women of color and black women are often much more predisposed to this. So when I broke down, and, I, and this data I think probably is going to be reflected around the world, so I want to kind of dive into this with you, Patricia, a bit as well. But out of that four and five, you know, the, the women who unfortunately died through childbirth, they broke down the data. And they understood in each different background, for each different race, racial, uh, there were different factors that implicated them. So there were people who were much more predisposed to mental health, to, to be dying from suicide. And there were those who would be affected by cardio and preeclampsia. And they broke it down. And it really says to me that there is not one pregnancy treatment that fits all. And I think this is, and this kind of goes, I'd love to hear from both of you, but I think this goes to what you were saying about this idea of like this, in, you know, this baked in sexism for childbirth and pregnancy, is that women are treated as a single group rather than individuals of color, of race, of background, of socioeconomic, you know, how do we, how do we change childbirth for the better? Yeah. Um, I just wanna add in terms of the, 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 the post, uh, the post uh, birth care, how important it is, and I wanna add the mental health issue as well, um, because a lot of women suffer from uh, post-pregnancy um, uh, depression, so that's a big problem as well. But also another point that, that Sarah just made is that we know our body, so when women tell their doctor something is not right, they need to listen, they need to listen to them. And we've all heard stories from quite you know, famous people saying, I had to put my foot down and tell that doctor what I was feeling so that my life could, could be safe. So that comes to that issue of sexism, like we mentioned, the issue of structural racism, because women of African descent are more the victims of that. We will ignore you, will not listen to you, you're obnoxious, you're loud, uh, you're complaining for no reason, you feel less pain so you can handle it, um, and all of these issues. And those are the kind of bias that we need to end in the health system right now because they are killing women and they are killing women that look like me and like a lot of them here in a much, much higher rates. And that's just simply not acceptable because I think the key word here is these deaths are preventable. And then, and I, I couldn't echo what you're saying more, and I think this is one of the things personally and professionally I'm incredibly invested in. The other question actually that really, as you were talking about that six week period, is so important, even just to gather yourself to back to even the semblance of health. One in four women in America go back to work within two weeks of giving birth because we have no paid leave. And I think this is an area in which it's kind of tied in to maternal mortality because if you are having a country, and there's only six countries in the world, some of whom are kind of tied to America as well, but um, who don't have paid leave for their citizens, which means that there are women who have to go back to work and they will be apart from the care that they need simply through the forcing of it. I'd love to get, I mean, obviously you, you, you don't have a boss in that way. You are your boss, but... I'm presuming you also have felt the pressure to return to you know, this idea of women must stay relevant and have no breaks. So can you talk to me a bit about the importance of kind of protecting that recovery period for you? Yeah, recovery is key. You know, again, that health, that, that process that our bodies go through is critical. Um, let me see, I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. Um, you know, in society, you definitely do, you know, the snapback is what we talk about. Like she snapped back, like, oh, okay, girl, look at her. Uh, which is a great thing if you could snap back. I have gained 60 pounds at probably almost at minimum, 55 to 60 pounds at minimum in all my pregnancies, so I can't be a part of that snap back like that, you know, in two months kind of thing. I try my best to get it down, but I also put, I put my own pressures on myself. I try my best not to live by society's measures when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, when you say these things, like these, this is astounding stuff to hear that we have to, you have to feel forced to go back within two weeks, right? That's just, it's really, I, I don't know if this is the best, but it was really unfair, right? It's, we shouldn't, it should not be the case. And why are we still talking about this now? Like paid, 
equal pay and everything or even the support of that. Like it's like we, it, the change needs to happen now. Um, you know, humans, the, the, our li lives are too precious, right? Everyone deserves that opportunity. So, um, you know, I have been fortunate enough that I can navigate through that. Um, but I do think that women deserve that opportunity, you know? And so, and I also too, I always like shout out the fellas in these moments too, because it's the support of you all, the fellas, that also is key for us, right? I think about conversations with my husband and his support is so meaningful and so powerful. Sometimes whether it's in a room of people and how he speaks about me or to me in front of people, how he encourages me. These things matter, especially in the workforce and the work field. The men, the voices of men are just are important in this journey for us as women. We need those men that are the true leaders of companies to continue to speak up and to factor in us and the importance of us and our journeys that we go on. You know, they say what, behind every strong man there's a strong woman, right? So that's a real thing. I'm just saying, give us some credit there. <laughs> um, but you know, it is time for, um, you know, we, we it's time to make that change. And I, I think the world honestly, in, 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 in some ways isn't ready, but is ready. You know, you talk about the mental health conversation Mental health conversations are way more prevalent than ever. Before, people would be quiet about their mental struggles. People are now more vocal. And I think that's exciting to see that people are feeling more confident to express themselves. There was a time where, you know, it was better to be quiet. Like, silence was more, you know, the best thing, and it's not. Um, so it's time for all these things to be addressed. And that's why I love what's happening with the SDGE program um, and being able to be a part of this, because these, are, these moments are the ways that we're going to really make change. Patricia, do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to add well. that, that, that the equity piece really needs to come at the social level as well. We're talking about paid leave. Women of African descent are overrepresented in the, in the informal markets, unemployed or underemployed. What does a paid leave mean for a woman that is unemployed, right? So we really need to dig deep and look at these structural um, issues and face them so that we can start saving these lives like right now. I, it's I, urgent. I think about this a lot, that just because a, you know, a country has paid leave doesn't mean that the women have access to it. And the irony in this country is that 25% of workers in this country have paid leave, but most of them are men because they work for the big companies that offer it. So it's a real, it's a real indication of a need. And it's not going to solve all the problems, but I do think it is definitely part of changing maternity and parental leave for people because it will change the way that people can experience. And, and, but also a key, a key aspect is improving access to maternal care. And actually I did want to, we're kind of shortish on time at the end, but I did want to talk about your foundation as well that you have with your husband because a lot of that is about giving the youth power and, and growing their voices. And of course we hope the world will change. But talk to me about the work that you want to do with your foundation to give women the power to advocate for themselves. Absolutely. Um, our foundation is called the Why Not You Foundation, and we believe in empowering the youth to lead with the Why Not You attitude. And our parents are very big on encouraging us to have a Why Not You attitude. Russ's dad would say to him, son, why not you? My parents would show to me, Sierra, why not you? So we're really big believers that every kid, not just every child, but every person, if you can adopt that mentality, the sky is the limit. Um, and that's where it starts, being able to instill that confidence you know, in every child. That's really important to us. Education is power. We wanna be able to help provide educational opportunities. We talk about the access and equity. That's really important. So we have our charter school, the Why Not You Academy in Des Moines, Washington. That's our first one. We hope to make many more, but it's so beautiful when you see kids come in like by choice because we take care of their tuition. And that's such a gift. You feel like you're going to help change their legacy, their family's educational legacy. And that's the gift that keeps on giving. So um, as it relates to the women, we want women to have a why not you attitude. In these moments, why not us? Why not be able to make change and see the difference that we need to see in maternal health for women of color? Why not be able to make change for us in maternal health in general as women? Why not be able to be seen as we should be seen as women and as young girls? Like That why not you mentality is so important to me and, and to us. And so we're really big on instilling that in the youth. And we know that if we ha they have that mentality, oh my gosh, how much you can achieve. And that's been who I've been from day one. I didn't have much coming up, but I had a big dream. I had a big vision and I had a why not you attitude. And that's why I sit here excited today and confident today to talk about these matters and to advocate for girls just like myself. Why not you? Because it is you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sierra. Thank you so much, Patricia. This has been fantastic.